Hi, Jonah. Hey, Bob. How you doing? I'm okay. How are you? I am not complaining, as usual. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright, publisher of the Non-Zero Newsletter, and this is the Non-Zero Podcast. You're Jonah Goldberg, editor-in-chief of The Dispatch, and I guess full-time publicist for it, judging by the fact that you've got a strategically placed sign that says The Dispatch right over your shoulder. Uh, yeah, that was a leftover from a conference we did, and I figured uh-huh. why not have it behind me? Just so, happens yeah. to be there. That's just where it wound up. Yeah. Well, if 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 that qualifies as a full time promoter, um, then your 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 standards for full time promoter are kind of low. But well, this is my, <laughs> gr- my my this is my great failing in life. That, that yeah, I I uh, I've fallen down on the promotion job more than once. But um, but not not today because I'm going to mention the name of this podcast again just to drive home the fact that the conversation we're having is in commemoration of Blogging Heads TV, which used to be the network that this is on. Uh, That network, the the YouTube channel is now non-zero. And Blogging Heads started a long, long time ago, longer ago than either of us cares to remember, perhaps, because you were one of the early Blogging Heads, as we used to call them. You, we started it in 2005, Mickey Kaus and I, and a tech guy named Greg Dingle. And Mickey is going to join us before long um on this in this very conversation um and you were among the first people that we had on after we ventured beyond the bob mickey orbit so you were i think as of 2006 early 2006 you were on blogging heads and those are early times right they were they were those were um i i did it obviously with you a few times and will wilkinson Right. Did it a few times. And then I did a regular thing with Peter Beinart quite often. I even did one, I believe, with Matt Iglesias. Um, mm-hmm. It was fun. It was, a, it was a simpler time. It was a simpler time. We were happier then, Jonah. Now we're, now we're, you know, rich and powerful and famous, but we were happier then. That's right. That's right. You That's know, right, the, except uh, for the rich and powerful and famous part. Our wish, our wish with the monkey paw delivered us all the riches that we wanted but but are we we were unhappy regardless are so. we happy so i've had a few of these conversations uh, in fact one with the aforementioned matt iglesias also one with david corn i've had one with, with ross douthit another early blogging head that has not yet uh, posted um i started off with a variation of this question i think probably with all of them and that is just that if you look back to you know circa 2005 2006 and compare it with now what would you say is the biggest change if i didn't even specify the dimension along which i want you your mind to wander it can be you know politics tech platforms media anything sports you name it the most momentous change yeah i mean it's an interesting question i mean i i don't know to be brutally honest i mean my personal life has not changed all that dramatically. I mean, there have been some career changes and that kind of thing. But um, more broadly, huh, it's an interesting question. I, I think to keep it in the spirit of the um, the pioneer days of this 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 venture, I think <clears throat> you know part of your pitch about blogging heads was the sort of disintermediation of media and that there was this opportunity for letting a thousand flowers bloom and there was a lot of hopeful stuff about all of that and um and there are some definitely some good things that came with that process but i think that process unfolded in a way that was um not necessarily for the betterment of society specifically i think the sort of the the natural trend of which I don't think we could have predicted at the time towards things like social media, which really didn't exist back then. Um, the destruction of blogging um, by Twitter, among other things, um, I don't think has necessarily been a positive development. And I think to put it into broader political terms, I think it fueled um, what was probably a process very well underway. We just didn't recognize it as clearly of the, the, the disintegration, the continued disintegration of the role of 
mediating institutions in the media, in politics, in culture generally, um, that at, at the time we sort of saw those opening cracks as these rays of light coming through and the, you know, sort of like the Apple commercial. And um, it turned out that the, uh, the crumbling of all of those walls uh, affected a lot of walls that in retrospect we wish were a good deal more intact. And I think that's sort of how I, I look at the so last So does that mean so. you think we we need more gatekeepers as in days of yore, or is that slightly different from what you're talking about? I think part of it is we need more gatekeepers. We need more more people. I'm a big, you know, Yuval Levin fan, and I think his, you know, Fractured Republic argument about the problem, one of the big problems with our culture is that um, institutions in the almost the broadest sense you can think of, maybe not in the economic sense, but institutions are supposed to be are supposed to form character. They're supposed to shape character to the good of the to the mission of the institution. And um, we now live in an era where very few people ask, "What is my role here? What am I supposed to be doing hmm. in concert with the mission of this institution?" And instead, we have people on both sides of the political aisle and the entertainment everywhere who parasitically use their institutions as platforms. To perform upon and you you find this all over the place in politics where people you know it's starting with four years of donald trump where he he used the presidency as the center ring of a circus to well and the republican the party earlier i mean that was the first sign that that the institutional strength wasn't what it had been the republican party didn't want him to be the nominee at least the, the elites right. didn't and but yeah. there was nothing they could do about it that's right and i think you know i mean i've been saying for a while now uh you know donald trump wasn't the cause of most of the problems with the culture or with politics. He was a symptom of them. But, you know, as as Orwell says, one can feel a failure and take to drink and become all the more a failure because one drinks. Uh, he accelerated the problems of sort of the deinstitutionalization of American politics and culture. Yeah. OK, the um, I mean, there are these upsides in theory. Uh, it's funny, you know, there are, uh, there's a certain amount of concern being expressed about how social media are getting in the business of censorship. And I have concerns about that as well. But I still think that if you compare like America today to the America of my youth, there are a lot fewer checks actually on, on what, in what, enters the discourse and on what people can say. I mean, there were there were just all kinds of gates We're back in the days of like three TV networks before there was even before cable TV was even a real force before we even had that much narrow casting, you know. Um, I mean, do you have like a view on that? Have you have you done a certain amount of complaining about uh, Facebook and Twitter kind of policing speech? Uh, compared to a lot of my former friends and colleagues on the right, uh, very, very little. Um, I don't, I think that, uh, look, I, I think the sort of the cancel culture problem is real to a problem on the left and the right. I think that the, the inability of higher education to perform its proper functions is a real problem. But generally speaking, I do not think that we have a censorship problem in this country. Um, we have speech is freer than it has ever been in American history. Most of the censorship that the social media platforms do is censorship that most people would approve of. Um, and to the extent there is censorship, and there, is, there are examples of censorship, um, it's, you know, there's a, definitely a political bias to some of these platforms. And it, 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 it sees threatening language on the right much more instantaneously than it does on the left and that that bias is something that people can complain about and all the rest but mm -hmm. for the most part i think the the you know censorship is the wrong word um well because it's not the government doing it for one thing although there is a right. distinctive problem presented by the fact that there there is naturally centralization in social media via kind of network uh, effects and so you do wind up with a small number of powerful platforms but it's still not the same as the government doing it yeah, I, I just I, I just don't get worked up about it. I think that is in the realm of utterly manageable, contestable problems within politics and culture and all the rest. I think the the better way to think about it is um, there's sort of a crisis of editorship um, in the sense that 
it used to be that if you want to like just sort of focus on our realm, right. For a second, if you were in journalism or in, you know, the world of ideas and whatnot, uh, and you were young and angry, you had to get past an internal gatekeeper who said, Hey, you know, let's, let's fix this. You're, you, you don't have evidence to back this up. You don't have mm -hmm. facts to back this up. Um, you got to make an argument. Um, you got to do reporting, whatever it is, you know, depending on whether it's opinion or, or, or reporting. And we now live in a culture where that, those kinds of internal forms of like, there's no, there's no good editor in the history of editing who wasn't a censor in the sense of they said, we're not running this at right. one point right. or another, right. almost on a daily basis. And that ethos of responsibility about, um, uh, you know, being careful about what you say and how you say it in a responsible manner. I think that has shrunk dramatically. And a big part of the problem is not so much just social media. It's the whole sort of triumph of clickbait culture that where we've gotten into a mode where we cable news does this too, where we monetize dopamine hits, where the essence of political combat is to make your own side really, really angry. And, and to also make the other side really, really angry because negative attention from the other side is a way to get positive attention right. from your own side. And I think right. that's just an unhealthy way to have public discourse. The whole point of blogging heads in the beginning was to have serious people who have serious disagreements have a civil conversation yeah. where they air civil disagreement. And it actually, and, I, I just to put in one ad for it, a little late now to promote it now that it's gone, but the uh, it, it did have a civilizing effect in the sense that you can take two people who had written nastily about each other yeah, uh, and, and put them face to face and they would have a little harder time being mean to each other. It was just an interesting right. effect. I think that's, I think that's absolutely right. But now basically the culture of arguing with your avatar with avatars is, yeah. is, is much more powerful. And it, I think it's fairly poisonous. There's still places to have, I mean, I think the rise of podcasts has been a generally very positive thing. Um, and there's still plenty of places to have discourse. It just doesn't dominate political attention, media attention. The headspace of people on the left and the right is so much more dominated by being angry. Uh, and I think that's a problem. Well, the incentives, as you said, are there, you know, to be tribal. That's how you get attention. And you you rise within your own tribe by, you know, misrepresenting the other tribe or at least taking the most extreme opinions expressed there and, and acting as if they're typical of that tribe and so on. There are all these bad effects. And as you said, the, even the big media, partly because of all the fine-grained data they have about which headlines are right. getting clicks, they're deeply incentivized to play the same game. Um, one question is, so this is all tied in with famously with political polarization. I mean, it to some extent is the same thing, but not entirely. Do you think that like the trend toward political polarization was well underway before it was abetted by the technology? Or do you see it as in some sense fundamentally a product of technology or what? Um, I, I Sort of like my point about Trump, I think a lot of these things were, um, these were trends that got amplified and accelerated because of technology. I mean, we know, <laughs> I mean, it's sort of a cliche to point this out at this point, but virtually every mass communication innovation going back to the printing press yielded um, sort of populist upheavals. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you don't get the Protestant Reformation without the printing press and contrary to some you know, sort of propaganda, there was a lot of populist, nasty populist upheaval that came with the Protestant Reformation and the Counter Reformation. Mm -hmm. And the populist protests of the 1930s were driven largely by radio and the, the violence and clashes that we saw in the 1960s were driven in no small part by television. And I think that now the rise of social media and the instantaneity of it um, puts all of that on steroids. And the difference is we had time to adjust to the printing press. We had time to adjust to radio. We mm -hmm. had time to adjust to TV. And the pace and acceleration of innovation in the social media space doesn't give our brains the kind of time it needs to sort of put these things in perspective. Maybe eventually we will be able to put this stuff in perspective and people will get rid of their TikTok and their Instagram and all that kind of thing. But by that point, I have no 
confidence that we won't be having implants in our heads or we're mm. getting all of our stuff, you know, fed into our glasses or whatever. And that part does worry me. Yeah, it seems things are moving faster than ever. The uh, technologically, the uh, I mean, you know, as for how long it used to take things to play out, that had an upside and a downside. I mean, we, one could argue that among the, the kinds of, uh, well, after effects, if not consequences of the Protestant Reformation was the wars of religion, which went on forever. Before, For a really long time. Before yeah. Europe got itself <laughs> under control. I hope I hope we get this under control uh, faster than that. Um, now, uh, I see that uh, our friend Mickey Kaus is in the waiting room. So I'll let him in. Should we conspire as the before I let him in as to like <laughs> what what we're going to gang up on him about? I certainly recommend at some point bringing up the fact that he voted for Trump twice. Uh, aside from that, I guess we'll just uh, see what happens. How long has it been since you uh, talked to Mickey? Have you? It's been a long time. I mean, yeah. I, I probably saw him in California at one point five six years ago, maybe maybe okay. a longer. You know. Well, Jonah, here he is. Let's see. He's uh, his bandwidth is. Oh, there he is. Oh, this is there great. I always love this part of things with Mickey when. Oh, no. Sadly, he realized we're here. It's best when he doesn't realize <laughs> you're there and he just like fools around with his smartphone. But he does this thing where he fi he, he brings his face up close to the screen, tries to figure out like how to make the sound happen. Hey, Mickey, how's yeah. the tech going? Uh, it's because my eyes are bad, Bob. Nothing oh, to do with sound. That, that hasn't mocking, happened to me. You're mocking a disability. <laughs> You're canceled. You're canceled. It's all over. So Am I even able supposed to call already. it a disability? Uh, is that even? I mean, that. But, Sorry. Uh, well, if you called it that, I guess it's okay for me to call it that. Um, He's other sided. He is other sided. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, yeah, ophthalmologically challenged. Uh, so you haven't canceled each other already? You've been doing this for like 20 minutes, right? No, we spent most of our time talking about you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's what I think. Well, I, you know, I, 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 as you, as I'm sure you discussed, I, maybe not, I, uh, I called my column after reading J uh, Goldberg files. Mm -hmm. I called my file. My oh, is that right? Column oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there are two people who, who I, I, am, I imitated when I started my blog, uh, in 99. One was, uh, 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 I don't who's, name is who's, who's, the, who's the woman who did the back page or the eight day week for the New York Observer? I don't think uh, I ever knew that. I can proudly yeah, say sure. that that's not something her, I've forgotten. It's something I her, never her knew. Father, her father is a huge economist in Peru. Oh, uh -oh. DeSoto? No, not DeSoto. Um, anyway, he has some he has some abbreviated he's called Triple K or PKK or something like that. Anyway, um, her style was imitatable, and, and and Jonah was basically producing what I would want to produce uh, <laughs> in his Goldberg files. It just it wasn't technically a blog, I guess, because it was just a website. It was a pre-blog blog. blog. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but it had everything else about it was a blog, and and you're just much more productive than I am, so you could generate it in a in a non-blog form. But but so that those were the two people I. Uh, Alice Kaczynski is the name oh, of the woman. Okay. I I imitated you and I imitated Alex Kaczynski. So I am um, I often I often brag about this because um well no one I can't say that very many people care or even impressed but, no, I, ca but I care Jonah what is but it But in the, in the great in the in, in the great tale of the begats about blogging um I I always take some pride of authorship because you know, Mickey was one of the great bloggers and he was at least partly inspired by me, which I would brag about. And then Andrew Sullivan was partly was largely inspired by Mickey. And so like in the great chain of being, I am I, I want I don't want to say I'm the father of blogging, but I am certainly one of the founding fathers of blogging. And, um, and I also created the corner. But of course, this is like being the the one of the greatest innovators of whale oil lamps because the tech <laughs> the world has moved on from this whole thing. Um, the, so, well, two things, Mickey, did you know that you inspired Andrew Sullivan? Is this an established fact? I had not well, heard I, this. I, I mean, Andrew asked, Andrew at the time was very flattering and said, you know, I'm, I, I'm, 
going to imitate you. I'm going uh, to become or much something. bigger than you. I admire you or, so much. And, well, there were three people who did this. Uh, Andrew, uh, Josh Marshall, and Glenn Reynolds all said, you know, this is a good idea. I'm going to do what you're doing. And then they were instantly much better and bigger. So uh, uh, that was, it was, it, 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 it may have to do with me, not with them. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, that, uh, huh. it's, um, the, I claim the Ur blogger was Herb Cain, the columnist. At the, oh, that's ridiculous. Yeah, We've the, had this conversation. Look, I was reading Herb Cain <laughs> when I was 12 years old, literally, when we lived in San Francisco. Well, it he, was a newspaper column, for God's sake. It was on physical. Little, there were no links. A lot, of, lot of little items. He published it seven days a week. And you had this vision of he, he, he when he was, when, they, when the days, the deadline was he would just take the paper out of his typewriter, yeah. hand it to the copy guy, and start a new item. It was just continuous. This, this is a version of a humble brag. You claim that there is someone who beat Mickey to the punch, and then it's such an implausible idea that he did that, that the, <laughs> our takeaway is that nobody beat Mickey to the punch. You know, it's like, no, well, in no, terms no, of no, blogging, I must true. yield to Aristotle. Right. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Jonah, my question no. for you is, so the corner, was that what brought National, Re National Review? Well, National Review Online is a phrase, NRO. Did you, uh, was that the beginning of National Review Online? The no, so the, the the there was a there was what we used to be called in the industry a placeholder or a placemat website for National Review starting in something like ninety six. In ninety eight, um, I started writing the Goldberg file, which was I mean one of the reasons why I was pre blog is that blog software didn't exist yet, and so I would have to send new items if I sent more than one thing a daily. It would have to be manually sort of put onto the page kind of thing, mm -hmm. but I would do small items you know racked up, and that got to be pretty popular. And so about six months into me doing the Goldberg file, they asked me to become the first uh, editor of National Review Online as like a sister publication, which would have its own con real content. And um, so I was the founding editor of National Review Online starting at late 98, early 99, somewhere in there. And then the corner uh, I came up with, uh, which I believe was the first group blog um, and was very successful, um, if I say so myself, was, I don't know, 2002, 2003, something like that. So NRO still existed now nro as the name lives on but as a entity it's not a thing anymore over at national review it's just sort of nationalreview.com or whatever they don't it's not part of the brand anymore okay so i had so uh you know this conversation with ross doubt that it hasn't posted yet but one of these blogging heads memorial conversations and he was saying that kind of in contrast to the incentive structure presented by social media the incentive structure in blogging was for serious, more or less honest intellectual engagement. Like you had your adversaries and you were symbiotic with them in the sense of arguing with them in ways that got attention and driving traffic to each other. But the way it worked for whatever reason is that you actually did serious engagement with, I mean, mm -hmm. maybe because it was a sustained dialogue and they would take you to account if you, if you presented a simplistic view of their argument, if you, if you straw man them or something, but a, a number of people have said this, that, you know, blogging, uh, they're, they're nostalgic because blogging was an era of serious engagement. Is that your, uh, I mean, who were, and, and if so, who were your kind of symbiotic adversaries mickey you were yeah, no, go ahead yeah no, I, I basically agree with that blogging was a real was i thought a real advance on what came immediately before it and was superior to a lot of what came after it and um i don't know i mean i had i had engagement you know i things between me and the glazes got nasty from time to time but um i had you know serious arguments with him i had both strenuous arguments and strenuous agreement with Andrew for a long time. I'm sure Mickey and I went back and forth on something or other. Um, um, uh, the guys at, uh, you know, Washington Monthly and all of those places. And I, and I agree that there was a certain sort of you sort of a sink or swim kind of, you know, debate kind of thing going where if you didn't make good arguments, you got, you got creamed for it you know you just got nailed from all quarters and so it for the people who were good at it um um it really you know i learned a lot it sharpened me up i i think that there were people who suffered 
who never had to, who never dealt with an editor, just sort of bypassed that experience. But if you had some writing chops and could let things go, like when I first started writing in the early nineties, I was a very deliberate plotting writer, draft after draft after draft. And one of the things about being dumped in the deep end of the, the internet pool was I learned how to let things go about how to like sort of be a better first draft writer and also how to like engage in arguments. And I, I miss that stuff. Uh, I mean, you can still have arguments. It's just the, the combination of sort of immediacy plus frivolity and, um, and engaging with a really wide group of people because you never knew who was going to pick a fight with you. Mm -hmm. um, I miss that. Twitter basically reduces everything down to takes. And it um, doesn't mean you can't have some interesting engagement. There's interesting things that happen on Twitter. But Twitter, because it was so much better at the, the instantaneity part of it, mm -hmm. at the sort of, you know, satisfaction of just jumping in right away, it just, it, it, we saw it at National Review. It was a huge problem where people didn't want to blog. They just wanted to engage mm -hmm. on Twitter. And, um, uh, and I think that's, I think Twitter probably more than anything else killed, um, uh, killed blogging. That said, you know, I think, you know, right now the dispatch is carried on Substack, but we're, we're leaving Substack and I'd have nothing bad to say about Substack, but, um, I think that Substack in many ways is, uh, a, uh, is, is, is blogging 2.0 in some ways in that, and if you actually look at the most successful people on Substack, Substack, they are disproportionately, I mean, I haven't looked recently, but at least, um, you know, the last time I looked at it, it was just disproportionately people who had come of age in the blogging era, you mm -hmm. know, it was Matt Iglesias and, uh, you know, me and David French, you know, the dispatch has been the number mm -hmm. one source of revenue on Substack since we launched. And, um, you know, uh, and I think, it's a great platform for people for established writers with loyal followings. Um, and that sort of level of engagement with readers that attracted a lot of people to blogging, you now find that more on the, on the newsletter side of things. So why are, just out of curiosity, why are you leaving Substack? Um, I mean, again, we had a great experience with them and, um, but our ambitions are to be more than just simply a bunch of one-off newsletters. And it is not the ideal platform for a group enterprise. If I were off on my own, just doing my own thing, mm -hmm. I'd probably stay on Substack forever because I think it's great for that. But if you want to actually build up a media company and a platform, they're making changes. They insist that we're making a mistake and that we'll come back one day and all that. That's great. Um, but we wanted to do something different than what Substack's technology would allow us to do. Mm -hmm. No, you want more videos or group? No, I hate video. They're pivoting. Oh. They're pivoting to video. I, I, I yeah. think that's going to be the future. <laughs> uh, so, what are you pivoting toward? Um, to be a full, you know, look. I mean, part of the problem is. I mean, again, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds on Substack because it's a it's a complicated relationship. But the the things it, it, on the analytics side, it doesn't let us do a lot of the things that we would want to do. If, like. We just want to do it, just say for the sake of argument, we want to be an online magazine. It is not a great platform for an online magazine. It is a great platform for a bunch of independent um, writers who want to outsource a lot of the pains in the ass of doing this kind of stuff to now, Substack. By, and they're very by good analytics, at doing you mean the statistical feedback they give you about, is that yeah, what you're talking about? Basically. Yeah, I, look, I, I got to say, you know, they. They, they, I got this uh, email from them. They said, you know, you're one of, you're doing well and people are doing well, get these free consultations and we'd like to help you. Here's a guy to talk to. And he said, do you have any gripes? And I said, man, the stats package, I, I got to say, it's pretty crude. And, and, and it's even been made worse in some ways recently. It, there's, don't get me started. I don't want, this isn't the place for that, but there's really, there's really work to be done on that front. Um, so you, you think Barry Rice is going to run into trouble? Is She seems to be trying to start a magazine. I think Barry, I mean, I don't want to speak for Barry. Um, Barry's a friend. I just did a podcast with her a couple of hours ago. Um, were, you, were, you, were you in Sun Valley with the moguls? No. Um, oh, but okay. uh, thank God. I, 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 it would not surprise me if Barry's running into many of the issues that, that we have run into. And again, look, we, it was the absolutely right business decision to sign up with them in the beginning. Uh, they saved us a ton of money and, um, helped us enormously and we're very grateful to them 
but you know, so have you looked at the, this, the at the Substack app? I actually you know, haven't. It's only on, I'm on Android, and it's only on iPhone, right? Yeah, I mean, part of the part of the problem with the Substack app, in my opinion, is that it basically, you know, my understanding, my vision of what Substack was going to be was very much sort of a, you know, a back of the house operation like Oracle, right. where it wasn't a public facing brand, and they seem to have pivoted to a strategy where they are the public facing brand and the people on Substack are subcategories right. of that. That seems look, to be a mistake. They want everybody to go, let's what's on Substack lately and Substack writers right. refer sub, other Substacks to Substack, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, let me just say a defense of that would be that one thing I think it's in their interest to establish and it's not easy is is network externalities. In other words, you know, network effects. In other words, the more a situation where the more people who are on Substack, the better it is for everybody who's already on Substack, right? And sure. I think that's probably what they're they're aiming for to some extent. And that, in principle, makes sense. It's not easy to do, uh, well, given the nature entirely. of their enterprise. I mean, they're, they're, Chris and those guys are very smart, and they have a vision for what they want, the role they want Substack to play in media and culture. And, and I wish them nothing but luck. But when you would open up the Substack app, you know, it makes it seem like the dispatch is a section of Harper's Magazine and Substack is Harper's Magazine. And that's not what we want. You know, that's not what we raise right. money to do. That's not what Steve and I. On are the other hand, most newsletters yeah. probably seem invisible when you open the Substack app. You should that's probably be flattered if you well, look like a whole section. But anyway, go ahead, are Mickey. You, are you are you going off on your own now? Uh, you're having a standalone text. Uh, we're we're, we're moving or... in that direction. It's part of a yeah. process. Yeah. yeah. I the, the point I wanted to ask. What you about is the current state of affairs where, you know, people like me are on Substack. Some of them are charging. Uh, there, there are people like uh, Matt Taibbi who write on and on and on seemingly without editorial direction who are very successful. But the whole thing seems unstable. It doesn't seem like, okay, this is the new age. We have some Substackers and Twitter sort of is is meandering along and the mainstream media is or isn't dying. I mean, I can't figure out which way things are heading, but it doesn't feel like, you know, this, there, there, there was an age of blogging and there was an age of Twitter. I don't know what the hell this age is. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think everything's sort of in flux right now and, and no models seem to be perfect at this point. Um, and, uh, um, I don't have a great prediction about, you know, where things are going to be going. My only point about bringing up Substack to begin with is that, like, I've always been, from my earliest days, you know, launching NRO, I've always been fairly um, unconcerned with the technology part. Uh, I think, you know, I remember when I first started NRO, the, the suits at NR would say, look, you know, Bill Buckley always used to say, you know, the mission is the mission and the magazine is just a means to fulfill the mission. And if we um, have to go all digital or have to go monthly or quarterly or whatever, that's all fine. If we're doing what National Review is supposed to be doing, my view towards this is very similar is like, you know, I don't want to know how my telephone works. I just wanted to do what I wanted it to do. And so I don't get hugely ideological about the form of the, the media. Uh, it's to me, it's the arguments that matter. And I think that we lost something when blogging went away. Um, and, you know, I think Substack recaptures some of the best parts of all of that, but it's just a different experience than it was in the age of blogging. Well, do they capture, are you aware of groups that are uh, capturing, I don't mean groups like yours that join together, but but like two different newsletters that wind up in the kind of symbiotic relationship we described as characteristic of the blogging age, where, you know, Ezra talks about Matt, Matt talks about Ezra, or maybe yeah. they're very different ideologies and they argue more maybe than Matt and Ezra did. But I, I wonder, don't know of any. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, any. if they could encourage that, that would be that would be a good thing. Um, uh, but uh, I'm not. A, I mean, I'm let's not also remember that there was this was a running joke about blogging where, you know, you'd have these stacked posts with Mickey says, yeah, you know, the, the new Democrats are dead and then in response to mickey i say well look at these people and then somebody else says well in response to jonah's post about mickey's post about blah, 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 and you'd get this ridiculous hot mess of stuff i mean it wasn't 
it wasn't all a Gonquin round table either. I mean, there was a lot of mess to blogging. <laughs> when, I, when I go back and read my old blog posts, they're almost incomprehensible because, because, because you don't know where to start and it's in reverse order. And I had the, I had this uh, tendency to put down my ideas in the order that I had them, which means I buried the lead all the time. It was like the best idea was the last idea. And I left it as the last idea <laughs> instead of elevating it to the first idea. See, the funny irony about that is like I've often said to people that with the exception of my father, um, Mickey Kaus was the best person at spotting the buried lead in a New York Times article of anybody I ever knew. And the funny thing is that you would often bury the lead about the buried lead <laughs> in your own writing. Well, I, at the time, I thought there was some virtue in the reader knowing how I had wandered onto the conclusion. But, I don't uh, think there is. Yeah, in, but in, in retrospect, it, it's it's it would be much easier to read if if the lead were at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so anyway, um, it, it, Bob, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say it's funny that Substack has given me the incentive not to bury the lead quite, but to lead up to the lead in a classic, almost like old-fashioned magazine style, because I found. One thing that works it, it, if you want to rack up paid subscribers, and, and I'm, I'm really not sure it's worth the price in a certain sense, but is you send something out to all your subscribers, paid and unpaid, and then maybe six, eight paragraphs in, you get to a kind of jumping off point. By that time, you've promised what you're going to deliver in the larger piece, but you haven't quite delivered it, and that's where you put the paywall. Now... Mm -hmm. Uh, that one virtue of taking that long to get to the point is you don't alienate unpaid subscribers. It's not like uh -huh. they open it up and it's like, oh, should I have to pay, pay to read the first two paragraphs? And, and, and the, so the only people who can see the paywall are people who like your stuff enough to have read six or eight paragraphs and they don't get yeah, pissed yeah. off. But yeah. it does, it, it, the two downsides are it leads to this certain kind of stylistic constraint, which actually I'm comfortable with because I used to write for old magazines and that was what, you did. Yeah, you, you had a little build up and then the nut graph and then you delivered. But the other downside is just that sometimes the stuff that's best at getting the paid subscribers uh, is the stuff you'd like to have out there in the conversation. But it can't right. be because it's behind a paywall. Right. And that is a real source of internal tension for me. Yeah. And it's part of the reason why you know, part of the problem is, is we were spoiled by the early Internet age. But like when you guys were writing for the new Republic, if you didn't get the paper copy of the new Republic, it didn't matter whether you buried the lead or not. No one saw it. Right. And it, you only rely on the virality of word of mouth or are other writers quoting it on a much on a comparatively glacial pace. And we now have this, this desire for instant gratification that social media has only accelerated. Um, and people's attention spans are worse. I know, I know my attention span is, is, is suffered because of, well, one, age, but two, you know, the, the social media stuff. Mm. My ability to write has suffered. I mean, I can't, I, I used to sit down at the blog and write like six paragraphs, just, you know, like it was breathing. And now I, I just can't conceive of doing that anymore. Hmm. I can still do that. I still, um, I, I, I you know, I, I wrote a syndicate. I've been writing a syndicated column. I switched to one a week about a, six months ago, but it's writing two a week for 20 plus years. I probably blogged a couple thousand words a week for 20 years, at least a couple thousand words, probably 8,000 words. And then did the G files, you know, multiple times a week and wrote for the magazine. And I've now developed, you know, this, I don't, believe in writer's block, but I believe that the fear of writer's block is writer's block. <laughs> and so I just sort of have to maintain the muscle memory by always be writing. And, um, huh. um, and so I can still do that, whether it's as good or whether it's, um, you know, right or not is a different matter. But like, I, 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 I remember re reading about some, these super joggers who have to run 10 miles a day or they think they'll die and they'll do it in rain and blizzards and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> if you. they take one day off, they freak out. I kind of feel that way about writing is that I really? hate taking time off to write because I feel like I'm scared. I won't be able to get back in the rhythm. Well, you were always exceptionally talented in that respect. You could also make me laugh out loud every time, every column I laughed out loud. And I appreciate there's that. Not, there's just not many people who can do that. So, uh, what about Bob, Mickey? 
<laughs> laugh out loud, I wouldn't say. Uh, well, give me a break. I've said some very <laughs> funny things. None of them spring to mind, but if you gave me an hour, existential insight, we don't. We turn to uh, you for. You can't have everything. Um, uh, <laughs> so, Mickey, your big symbiosis with Josh Marshall back in the day, right? That was that your biggest single symbiosis. It was, symbiosis. You mean you had a? We had a. We argued you with each to other him more than you linked to anyone else, and for a time, it was vice versa. I think, right? Maybe I'm imagining it. No, we did that. I did it with Glenn Reynolds. Uh, yeah. Andrew and I got into a, a bunch of fights over Iraq during the era when Andrew was demanding that everybody come out either for or against the Iraq war. No more, no more shilly shally. He was basically bullying people to mm -hmm. say they supported the war. Uh, and then he decided I was a racist. Uh, I forget. He got into some fight and he pulled out the his Trump card, which is something I wrote defending a bar called Barney's Beanery. Uh, and and it got pretty nasty and I actually thought our relationship was over, uh, that we were enemies for life, and it didn't happen. Andrew always uh, forgives. I, Go ahead, Jeff. So I have, a, I have a question for you, Bob. I mean, like, you're, I, at least in this triumvirate, you hold down the left flank. I think that's fair to say. Fair to and, say. And um, uh, it seems to me that one of the problems that the left has, I mean, in, don't get me started. The right has many, many problems. But one of the problems that the left has... If you use the phrase controls, liberal fascist, Jonah... I'm not going to use yeah, okay. it. Okay, we I'm, should plug I'm the book, though. Jonah's the author of the book Liberal Fascism, yeah. which you're probably still getting royalties from, right? Every now and then, yeah. Every it's in like 13 languages or something. Um, yeah, there you go. So, Sorry, go but, ahead. Um, Just don't call me a fascist, but, but go ahead. Um, the, it seems to me that and Michael Lind wrote something on the, along these lines recently, and you know, I'm not a huge Michael Lind fan, but I thought it was a good argument, um, that part of the problem with the left these days is that um, it's, not so much, it's not so much that the left controls the commanding heights of the culture, because I think that's been true my entire life, right? In Hollywood, academia, mainstream media, and all that kind of stuff, but that it's become much more of a monoculture and um, the ability to have disagreements about um, uh, different approaches, different, uh, you know, understandings of, you know, various forms of identity politics is sort of been sort of homogenized out of a lot of the left. And it makes the, from my perspective, who, someone who grew up reading the New Republic more than National Review, I find it... Um, kind of depressing that that you feel like once you know what one liberal columnist's position is on something, you kind of know what all of their positions are on something because there's just not a lot of tolerance, particularly in the blue check mark sort of Twitter mafia, to be, you know, against the grain the way there once was. You miss, Do you think you that's miss, fair? You miss the exciting debate over popularism, Jonah. That's right. And it, it, but like it's I, and I love that debate, but it feels like um, the whole point that there was a debate is because I'm right about the and the general pressure. I mean, look. Well, you but guys, you said you said there's not much in the way of debate. That's kind of a debate, but but I, your your point in a way is borne out by the fact that the people on kind of on the popularism side, like Matt Iglesias, there is an attempt to kind of expel them. Yeah, uh, and I, I I think that's true. I mean, I'm not the best person to ask because. I'm not all that wrapped up in identity politics. I mean, I don't feel all that strongly about identity politics one way or the other. I just worry that it's like strategically not a great thing for mm -hmm. kind of the left. And that's uh, part of the source of my skepticism about taking it too far. The um, I will say there's also, in addition to kind of the mats of the world, there's the left left. I mean, that's where uh, some pretty strong blowback about against identity politics at least in extreme form, can be found because, of course, on the true left, traditionally, uh, it's, you know, class-based politics is the right. main thing, you know, Karl Marx himself. That's the idea. And so... Uh, that's why the best stuff about the 1619 Project came from those socialists, you know, who well, it, got those interviews did. with those it guys. Did. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, you know, Glenn Greenwald and, and uh, a lot of these people are like, they, they don't want to see in a way, well, I don't want to speak for him, but I don't want to see Democrats give up 
on people who demographically you might think as classic Trump voters, you know, working class whites in the Midwest or something, when historically they would have been targets for the for the Democratic Party. So I'm you're not going to hear me uh, launch a staunch defense of wokeism, I'm afraid. It's it, I, I just will point to those two forms of reaction against it. One, you've got kind of the centrists, the, the Matt Iglesias is, and then you've got the left left. Uh, and I uh, encourage continued blowback from both of those directions because I think it would be healthy. Um, yeah, I, I still think that, the, that those guys amount to evidence that the thesis is wrong. They're just examples of how it's the, the process is not fully complete and how, um, uh, you know, any serious phenomenon is going to have pushback or counter examples. But, um, you know, the the I mean, take the 1619 project, the, the way the New York Times handled all of that. Um, uh, there was not a robust attempt by by sort of your typical mainstream media liberal op ed pages to push back on that. There was not a sort of full throated um, engagement with it. It was, oh, my gosh, look how interesting it is. And then a bunch of right wingers would say, look how interesting it is that the was it the whatever that wobbly group is the IWW that you know, the, the that, IDW the intellectual dark yeah. web the, no 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 the, the, the international oh, the socialist oh, the international thing. workers of the world or something or yeah the, and they were the guys who went and talked to those historians and yeah you know it, it pains me that, it, that it, it fell to them to do it but in some ways look uh, part of my I agree with you about the class thing I have become nostalgic for class based um, left left wing arguments because they um, cut across a lot of the bullshittery of what I see as sort of the dominant form of the left these days. And um, I'm someone who thinks both parties suck. And um, and it would be in both parties' interests to sort of walk away from all of the forms of identity politics. But more importantly, it would be in their interest, the interest of the country for them to do it. And I, 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 I don't see it happening nearly as much as I would like. Yeah, yeah. I... Uh... No, I'm I'm I I I worry tremendously, uh, you know, and, and uh, I wish I wish Biden would have uh, more, more something more in the way of sister soldier moments in in this regard. I mean, I'm not sure it'd do any good, honestly, but uh, it worries me. You know, one thing about as to the 1619 project, it reminds me of what we were saying earlier about how blogging involving deeper engagement. One one thing that. Uh, I, you know, the modern terrain of discourse encourages is, you know, because you are so often preaching to your own choir, so much of the dismissal of the 1619 project, and it sounds like maybe the analysis you just alluded to is an exception, and I should go and read it, but I kept wanting to hear somebody explain to me what exactly it got wrong and why it was wrong. And mm -hmm. so often you, the people like even Glenn Lowry, who, who I love, but I, I kept I kept listening to him denounce it. And I wanted to hear the blow by blow. Like, what exactly did they get wrong? Maybe he did get around to it. But um, I, there were I, some interviews with people like Gordon Wood and those guys. Yeah. who Gave very sustained. Maybe I should have looked harder. Yeah. But I do think a, a problem, certainly generically, we have is just so much as people, you know, sneering at other people in the presence of people who already agree with them that the other people need yeah, to be smeared at. And uh, I agree. Well, I, I, I'm, a, I, I'm still a believer in the Pat Cadell, uh, who, who was his mythical candidate who occupied the center and, and, and beat everybody, Senator or somebody. Um, he, um, he, he always ran this mythical candidate who was sort of a, you know, left on, you know, protected social security yet avoided foreign entanglements or something. And and that that candidate pulled incredibly well and beat everybody. Uh and I still think that it, it's so obvious on issue after issue that, you know, a candidate who actually forcefully occupied the center would would beat the hell out of everybody. And somehow the the media has become it was always true that our politics conspired against this result. But now the media has conspired against this result because it's now split into two teams, yeah. and, and, no, and nobody can 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 uh, you know make a living. I think in that's the right. Center. I think I think Joe Manchin is probably on paper the most yeah. popular. He's in the sweet spot of American politics, and he's despised 
by Democrats. And um, um, and if he were a Republican, he would be despised by yeah. Republicans. Well, that's what I was right? going to ask you, Jonah. Don't Republicans face the same problem? I mean, let, let's imagine that Joe Biden is the candidate again, which I hope he won't be. But let's imagine that he is. Almost any Republican could beat him. Ex and Donald Trump could beat him, but he might not. And yet sure. Donald Trump is one of the people more likely to be the candidate, right? I mean, uh, I, I feel that, you know, if the Republican is Trump, almost any Democrat could beat him, except maybe not Joe Biden. And if Joe Biden is a candidate, almost any Republican could beat him, except maybe not Donald Trump. And yet Trump and Biden are the two probably most likely single candidates. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, just look at 2016. Hillary Clinton was the single most unpopular candidate in america with the possible exception of donald trump mm -hmm. and or vice versa i can't remember who was in first and who was in second but they were both despised and um um and now we have they're just mammoth just had a poll which said something like 32 percent of americans think donald trump shouldn't run again or should run again and 29 percent of americans think joe biden should run again that our politics is dominated by these two septuagenarian doddering you know bags of bones is insane and yet the institutional sort of forces are are pointing that way i don't think it's a lock that trump runs again but i think it's certainly crazy I, to bet heavily against it i think both prospects are diminishing with uh encouraging rapidity i think, I think right. Tr trump is making such wh why why are the democrats all of a sudden winning in generic polls part of it is that the january 6th commission has gotten surprising traction uh and the media is all you know unified in its in its fixation on that but the other thing is trump is making an idiot of himself he, he's attacking elon musk he doesn't have to attack elon musk uh he seems hard like to resist a, hard to resist but i take you um, the scorpion was, doesn't have to sting the frog <laughs> it, it is in Donald Trump's nature to do such things, right? Uh, so now, I, um, I should say it could be a couple of weeks before this goes goes up, so it could be overtaken by events, and it it could okay. be by the time this airs, Donald Trump will seem like a genius. But actually, that can't happen. But uh, some something could that will make this seem dated. But uh, but anyway, go ahead. What were you going to say? The you, I, I hope you're right, Mickey. Uh, the only well, this is a conversation you and I have about every other Friday, so we don't need to get deeply into. Who, my hopes for the Democratic candidate, but um, but it is, I, I mean, to get back to uh, the kind of long view we're taking generally in this conversation, we're just describing the dynamics of polarization where, you know, mm -hmm. classic political theory is if you want to win the election, your candidate moves as close to the center as possible. But our politics now seem to preclude that on both sides. Yeah. And I, I, I have a long list of, of, of villains in this. I think primaries are error. Are terrible. I think part of the problem is Congress doesn't do its job, and so Congress is supposed to be the place that where politics happens. Instead, politics is spilling out all over the place because it's not happening in Congress. Um, I think the balkanization of the media. We've gotten to a place where too many outlets think their job is to tell their audiences what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. Um, and in an era of negative polarization. Um, as long as you hate the other party enough, that's a qualification. And um, it's it's a hot mess, you know? So how pessimistic are you long run? I mean, you could mount an argument that there's no way out of the spiral. People have mounted that argument. Um, and, and, and one version of that argument, I think, is that technology has so changed the context of our democracy that you really would need to uh, change some fundamentals about it, like at the constitutional level, and uh, to 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 make it, uh, you know, a, a representative democracy that functions even in this technological age. And yet, one thing the technology is doing is uh, hamstringing the process so much that that can't happen. It just can't happen. You can't do coherent, big picture change from within the system. That that's one argument, but. Are you guys as pessimistic as people who make such arguments are? I'm not. Long term, I'm not that pessimistic. I mean, I, I think at some point, look, there are a lot of problems that we have in this country in terms of the politics, which would be solvable by, you know, I mean, I would argue getting rid of primaries, maybe some jungle primary 
you know, reforms kind of things if you want to do it that way instead. Um, getting rid of cameras on Capitol Hill. I mean, it's hard for me to believe that those kinds of, I do believe that those kinds of things will go a long way to fixing a lot of our problems. And it's hard to believe for me that the, the country is going to fall apart at the seams, but for not fixing those kinds of things. I also think that there is a, you know, um, there's a really robust capacity in America for self-correction and self-reform. And the problem is the, th the, the, the downside is, is that you got to make mistakes to learn from them. And um, what is it? Edmund Burke says examples, the school of mankind, and he will learn it. No other. So I think in the short and medium term, I think we're going to get more political violence. I think we're going to get more jackassery. Um, but a lot of the stuff that we complain about has to do with the fact that there's a very small stratum of political tribes that are dominating political discourse. And um, I, I'm sort of a Herb Stein on this, you know, that which cannot go on forever must eventually stop. And, and I still think this is a good and decent country. I don't think we're on the verge of civil war. I think we're on the verge of some really ugly stuff for a little while. And it makes me sad, but it doesn't make me despair. The only solution I can think of is somebody really charismatic who 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 sort of comes along and just beats the hell out of everybody and 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 shows people that a sensible sort of uh, you know cut the crap uh, let's get down to business attitude will win the day uh, and uh, that person is Gavin Newsom no it's not uh, <laughs> I don't I don't know who that person is and if you know if 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 if, if that person were on the scene I would be touting him but. Uh, somebody Kennedy-esque uh, with with uh, a little more substance maybe than Kennedy had. I mean, an interesting contrafactual is what if Donald Trump hadn't screwed up the Georgia election and Republicans held on to the Senate um, in 2020, um, Joe Biden all of a sudden would have a very different presidency and I think a much better presidency. But Joe Biden right. was sort of temperamentally incapable of standing up to the base of his party. He got seduced by this go big bullshit about a new New Deal and bigger than Obama. And um, it led to all sorts of problems. But if he had the excuse of saying, look, I can't do all these. I'd love to do all these things you want me to do, but I can't do them because the Republicans control the Senate. It would have restrained him. And I, I just have a hard time believing that the republic is doomed because, um, you know, What's what's it? John Ostoff and Gabriel Warnock won, you know, the state of Georgia, and, and I, things are going to get worse. But they're not going to go off a cliff, I don't think. I guess when you think about it, Obama was as close as we're going to get to my mythical candidate. Yeah, but and he he, uh, and he he couldn't stand up to the Democratic Party, so that wasn't the only problem. He had subtly was polarizing problem. properties. Uh, okay. I think that uh, he also that, didn't care about the party, right? He kind of tried to build a parallel structure outside of the party. What I mean, I firmly believe that the problem, the, uh, the problems of our partisanship in this country, come from the fact that our parties are weak, not that they are strong. Because weak parties create strong partisanship, and people internalize as a matter of sort of a secular faith, culture war, politics, whatever. Um, this, this is the problem of the politics spilling out of Washington because Washington's not doing its job. If all of a sudden the parties actually had a, you know, this gets us back to where we were in the beginning about institutions. If if the if the political parties had a robust sense of their long term interests in the way that Madison and you know all those guys at the beginning of the the party system envisioned, um, things would be better. And you know, you try I try to tell people that you know. The, the reasons why we can't have nice things is because the parties are too weak and not because they're too strong. And they look at me like I got three heads, but a strong party system would never have allowed Bernie Sanders to run in the democratic party for president. A strong Democrat Republican party would never have allowed Donald Trump to run in the Republican primaries. And, but because they're as, as Ross Douthat once said, they're like, our parties are like fueled jet liners, you know, you know, airplanes sitting on the tarmac waiting to be hijacked. <laughs> um, and the, and the parties basically act as if they're branding companies that ch change their brand based upon whoever's the president of the United States. Um, you don't get the kind of discipline and rigor that you know 
Every, but, everyone, well, every four years, both parties run as if this is their last chance to ever be in power again. And then they govern like it and they swing for the fences. They don't go to the center. They don't try to win over people on the other side. And that becomes self-fulfilling prophecy. And then the party is voted out in the same pattern repeats itself. But under your under your party, strong party system, we would have had Hillary Clinton versus Jeb Bush. And I I find it hard to believe that would be a better. Well, but in, in the strongest version of the strong party system, you have these master strategists picking the optimal candidate, and it's not Hillary Clinton. Right. Uh, but that's but right. that's the strong version. Now, um, Joan, in a way, what you just described seems to me like a special case of something you said before Mickey showed up. Which you attributed to which Yuval was it? Uh, who Yuval <laughs> Levin? Yeah, yeah. who? Uh, I, I hadn't quite heard it this way. I mean, I, I, it's clearly true, and I've kind of thought about it because it is so clearly true. But just that all, most if not all, institutions increasingly are things that their members and their more prominent members just parasitize. They're just platforms mm -hmm. that they use for their own. It's like you know, a professor at a university. Go develop a big follow. Who's this? Who's this law guy from Yale? Uh, you know, or no, the philosopher from Yale, Jason. Whatever. It's like go. go um, you, you just develop your own following. You use the institution as a platform to develop your own following, rather than see your membership in the institution as grounds for advancing the interests of the institution. This yeah. is like a general phenomenon, and that that makes sense to me, and it's largely a function of technology, uh, which isn't to say that we won't kind of catch up with it eventually and adjust and, and institutions won't adjust. But I think I do think that's in some ways where we are. Mickey, did you yeah. have this? this th well, go ahead, Jonah. Well, I, so, Mickey, just you've all met, you've all live in uh, my colleague at the American Enterprise Institute and, and really one of the smartest guys I know. He makes this point that institutions are supposed to mold character, that you subordinate some of your agencies for the betterment of the institution. Classic example would be the Marines, right? You go in a irresolute damn hippie and you come out a Marine, right? The Boy Scouts, you go out a sort of a barbarian kid, you come out sort of disciplined. Um, but newspapers it used to be that you, you weren't allowed to just go freelance your own cult of personality. Um, and you had to just do the work, you had to do your due diligence and rise through the ranks. And now the incentive structure in our culture is to go out on Instagram or Twitter or wherever and get your own following and get your own brand. Everybody's in the personal brand business. And say, look, I mean, like we can have an argument about Colin Kaepernick. I don't really, I find the argument kind of boring, but Colin Kaepernick used the NFL as a platform for himself. You can go Elizabeth Theranos. I mean, you can go, it's a problem throughout the culture. Ted Cruz doesn't give a shit about the Republican Party. He cares about his own brand. AOC is an outward facing brand, you know, AOC brand obsessive, not necessarily a Democratic Party obsessive. And the, the fix to a lot of our problems, I would argue, is to have stronger institutions that you know, as Yuval says, the first question anybody who's part of any kind of organization, whether they're a priest or an editor or a journalist, whatever, is to say, what is my role here? What am I supposed to be doing? And if and and that answer is going to be different than your own self-aggrandizing pursuit of celebrity. And too much of our politics and our culture generally is about that. And we have this notion that you know, was it E. Schott Snyder used to say is that the, the, the democracy is what you get between the parties, not within the parties. We've democratized the internal decision making of parties to the point where the most demagogic guy who gets the biggest Twitter following has a lot of success. My, and I think that's a shitty way to run politics. Yeah. This may confirm your point, but uh, it, 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 it's very it's sort of it, it, it's triggered something in me because. For a long time, I've been thinking that all the times where I've spent being the good organization man, I was a good organization man at the Washington Monthly, tried to build the magazine, at the New Republic, tried to build the magazine, at Newsweek, tried to build the magazine. In terms of what's it done for me now, a complete waste of my life. <laughs> hasn't, hasn't done shit for me. Okay, nobody says, oh, Mickey, the Monthly won the National Magazine Award for graphic design, and that was you helped contribute to that. Nobody says that. The only things that have redounded to my benefit that are going to be, you know, uh, 
are the things I've done for myself. I started a blog and I wrote a book. Okay. Those are the things that paid off in terms, and they were things that brought notoriety and publicity. And it was a, it seems to be a huge con that the institutions ever con people into devoting their lives to the institution. That was idiotic. But wait, like, Mickey, if you had it not been for the New Republic Newsweek, whatever, you would not have been in position to develop a following for your blog in the first place. You couldn't have uh, just shown up out of nowhere and not like known the people you had gotten to know in the business and, and developed the happened. degree of name recognition you developed at the New Republic. You couldn't Who? just, there were other people trying to start blogs, name them. You Who? can't, because if they didn't have something going there for was them, nobody never else. Them. Everybody else could find a job. I'm the only guy who couldn't find a job, so I had to start a blog. Well, that was I because I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to chastise you over things I've already chastised you for. But you know that was because you ill-advisedly did not take Slate up on their offer to write a blog about the campaign you were running for oh, Senate. Please. That How was that go, by the way. Anyway, it, it, the, the, yeah, but but I digress. That's why you wound up not. Having, but Slate got you to a point where where you were well known enough to have the blog. Mm. It did. It did. And I mean, by the I bet, way, I, I mean like like uh, Mickey's a sui generis figure and i don't think we can extrapolate large social trends by making <laughs> personal experiences but uh i mean a, a better example for the kind of thing i'm talking about would be stephen glass and you know, stephen glass put his interests about becoming a celebrity writer definitionally above the interests of the new republic but that didn't and work to, out well for him so that's kind no, of no i know but, my, but, the, but but this is part of my point is it's bad for institutions when people do this when i i don't know anybody who works at a mainstream news outlet of a position of responsibility that doesn't at least see their reporters Twitter activity as at, at minimum um, a double edged sword, right? I mean, there are advantages to it, but there are also real disadvantages to it because when you spill your id out in public um, about your biases, it doesn't help you uh, as an objective reporter. And, um, but you can just find, you, know, you, you see these kinds of problems all over the place where, the 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 idea that one should should i mean we're all you know lifelong writers it's understanding that you know at some point you want to be bigger than the institution you're at you know but like one of the things i always loved about national review is that people understood that like the 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 institution was more important than the individual and um i i think that there are a lot of kids who come up now who think they have to be the, if they're not the center of attention if they're not being controversialists if they're not um, you know, uh, getting the attention for themselves rather than their institution that they're, 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 they're idiots. And I, I think that's a bad way, particularly when you're talking about institutions that aren't journalism, but are like, you know, the military. Um, there are places mm -hmm. where you see people or the political parties um, where being, I would, I think both parties would be much better off if the members of the parties cared more maybe not more than their own careers, but more than they currently do about the good of their actual parties. And they don't. And that's one of the reasons why the parties are so irresolute and why we've outsourced so much of our politics to non-party organs, whether they're in the media or special interests, is because the parties don't do the work the parties are supposed to be doing. Yeah. Every time I see a retirement party uh, on uh, notice on Twitter, so-and-so devoted his entire life uh, making the history to the history department at the University of X. I think, what a fucking fool. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I, I, it's, it's my instant reaction because there's no, the payoff is not there for all yeah, the but, effort, that, uh, make, all I, the I brilliant wild, effort this guy might have put in to developing the history department. It did wildly not pay wrong off. wrong about this. I, I think you're just wildly wrong about this as a matter of social science that the places where we get the most satisfaction and happiness in life have to do with faith, faith, family, friends, community. Um, the people was, that you know. I was about to say, but like, but are they? But who is happier? And I agree with you, Jonah. Um, that faith, I'm I'm there, I'm there with faith, family, friends, and community. But this is neither. This is the job. No, but what we're, what Jonah and I are saying is, you're right that they would have been more prominent if they had uh, sacrificed the interests of their institution, possibly. But would they be happier? I think that's what Jonah is saying, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean it's a, it's a difference between eulogy and resume, right? Your resume might have been better if you said, you know screw this institution, you know, screw my family, screw everybody. I'm going to do everything I can to be the most famous person I possibly can. But that's a shitty way to live a life. 
And I think that this is one of the problems we have in culture right now is that the, you know, one of the reasons I started the dispatch, I love national review. I was not forced out and not quit in a huff, but, but a lot of my heroes, you know, were institution builders and I had never done that. And I think that there's an enormous amount of satisfaction with actually building something, which being part of an institution, part of a group. And I have to sublimate my own personal career stuff all the time to that, you know, and this is like, I mean, I hate the phrase cause larger than yourself because a healthy person has lots of causes that are larger than themselves. They just may not be their political career or their professional career. It may be their family, it may be their friends, it may be their faith, it may be their community. And your argument that you're a sucker, if you didn't put all of that first, um, if you didn't put you know, your career and your celebrity first, I think is part of the problem um, and okay. is not true for most people. I think you're a sucker, even in obituary terms, even in eulogy terms. Well, maybe of course not you are, because that's maybe all not, about prominence. Maybe not eulogy, but obituary. Obituaries are all about well, that the That is the key distinction. Where, where you, did you, not, want, you did not serve your institution. Do you want truly heartfelt eulogies, or do you want a prominent obituary? This is a great choice in life. I'm, I think that's I'm, right. I'm, I'm, I'm aiming for neither, and so far I seem to be on track. Uh, but that, I mean, that's... I, I, I went so to a funeral of a... I don't want to give his name, but, you know, somebody I knew very well. Um, and there wasn't a single story from a friend or family member about what a great guy he was, about a personal kindness that he did. It was all resume stuff. Yeah. And, you know, the old cliche about no one on their deathbed ever said, I really should have spent more time at the office, um, I think is true. And this doesn't look, I, I care about my career. I have no problem with people who have ambition and all of that. But to say that somebody who had a rewarding life in our history department, where he worked with colleagues and raised a generation of students who all, you know, felt passionately about the contribution and the molding of their characters and their professions, that somehow that made him a sucker, I just think is kind of a gross, cynical, you know, sort of, it's almost a caricature of what, like, leftists say capitalism does. And I just fundamentally reject it. No. There is a distinction between devotion to an institution and devotion to a cause. You've used both terms kind of, I think, Joan. And, you know, Mickey has his cause. He, he's determined to make sure we don't get a child tax credit. And it's, it's working. <laughs> a, working a, so refund a refundable child a refundable, tax credit. Okay. I'm, happy but, with um, an, I'm happy with a non-refundable child. No, but I'm serious. Mickey does, is devoted to a cause. And it's larger than that. But it's an ideology that he's sure. serving and it, it is it has brought you comrades. And of course, there is this weird Trump thing that has fractured probably your network of comrades, uh, especially in light of January sixth. But um, but you have maintained you've remained faithful to a a cause. You know, it's uh, it's you know the Pink Floyd line. Did you exchange a walk on part in a war for a lead role in a cage? You don't have a lead role in a cage. That's the good news. Bad recording, Pink Floyd. Yeah. Um, the uh, the uh, I, I I do, but I think I'm a sucker. That's the point. You 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 do have what? I've I've devoted my life to blocking amnesty and the and welfare. What what do you wish you had done? Where would you like to be? Uh, good question. Uh, would you like to be Jonah? I'd settle for Jonah. Jonah's in a good place because Jonah is going to is starting an institution that everybody is going to recognize as Jonah's institution. He's not you the, know, honestly, the guy who follows. Uh, honestly, it's the guy I who follows think... Jonah who's the sucker. No, but <laughs> but he has not branded it as prominently with his name as is common these days. It is thought of as the Dispatch, and right, that's almost right, become unusual right. to even sublimate yourself to that extent. I mean, a better but example, that... Steve, my partner Steve A. Is Steve has barely written a word in two years because he's dedicated himself entirely to the back of the house stuff of like mentoring kids, doing hiring, doing CEO yeah, stuff. Yeah, and yeah. it's not increasing his celebrity and he's, and he's perfectly happy about that. And I just think that's a better way to think about it. I mean, like I, I, you know, I'm at CNN now. I'm glad to be at CNN, all that kind of stuff. I'm glad I left Fox and all that. But when I left Fox, I had no expectation that I was going to land at another network. I had no offers. I gave up a contract with 13 months left on it. And I was so happy to leave, even though it cost me, you know, in the moment, 40%, 50% of my income. And um, 
And while I'm happy to be at Fox and I'm happy, I mean, I'm happy to be at CNN. I'm happy for the income. I get no psychic satisfaction anymore from like being on TV. And mm. I, I can't tell you how many people I know who would dry up like dog shit and blow away if they weren't on TV for six months. It is, and the, I, and I've, I've seen so many people ruined by momentary moment, momentary experiences of fame and relevance. Um, and the incentive structures are all for encouraging people to pursue those bad decisions. And um, I, 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 I count myself very lucky that, that I grew tired of, of all of that kind of stuff because it doesn't fill the hole in your soul and it doesn't give you any real satisfaction. There's some fun to it. Sure. And, and all that, but I, I, I don't think I was a sucker for leaving. And I don't think, you know, um, and I, I just like, I, I'm just really surprised, Mickey, that basically your argument boils down to we are homo economicus and we should be maximizing our careers no, for satisfaction. And I just, that, 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 I don't see it that way. It's homo economicus. <laughs> uh... but, but but the funny thing is, Mickey, you much more than me are a deeply social person and you have invested large quantities of time in social networks, in friends. And that's a decision you've made. And uh, I assume that pays off. I wouldn't know because I'm much more of a loner. Uh, I mean, I, uh, but, but it, it, it's, it's, you know. In other words, you, I don't think you've acted uh, like the kind of person you're right at this moment describing yourself as being. And I, <laughs> it's, it, I get, my point is just that w w when I think of things I should have done, bizarrely, uh, pursuing an academic career is the thing I think I should have done. And, and of course, and then academics. betrayed the university you and were then at. You could, and then use the university as a platform <laughs> for my own independent celebrity seeking purposes. Well, that's yeah. a, I mean, look, or I maybe you get an that. obituary where they say what a, what a, jewel of the political science department you were <laughs> right. um you know and yeah. and you the, might, have, um, might have been I, the right call it's just it, but in, in under in college i studied under a guy named steve margland who had a theory that no no group of rational people left to their own devices will save money at the rate that society requires you to save money at to grow so there are all sorts of cons and schemes that society has to to get people to save more money than they really want to for the future. Nobody really gives a crap about the future. At least they don't give as much of a crap as society as a whole wants. So the great leap forward, they use you know like brute force of the state to get you to save money. And you know capitalism uses growth. It takes a while for your uh, consumption to catch up with your income, so you inadvertently save money. But nobody rationally would save enough money. Similarly, I think nobody rationally would go to work for large organizations their entire life anymore. Maybe back then, but now the organ you know, you devote your life to an organization, it's going to be dead in 10 years. And then where are you? You 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 have a you have a dead organization that owes you undying loyalty. Um, so uh it, it it there's some con involved in the Yuval Levin paradise where you con the people into devoting their lives to the institution. Yeah, I don't think Yuval would ever have used the word paradise. And and I don't think that there's a con, you know, I'm a big believer in the concept of earned success, which is not necessarily about money. It's about feeling valued and, and needed. And you can get it from all sorts of different things. And one of the places you get it is from, you know, having a level of commitment to an institution. We are, you know, I like the homo economicus, you know, formulation, but a lot of people aren't performative in the way that we are for a living. And what, you know, and they get real life satisfaction from, you know, it doesn't have to be the same corporation for 30 years, but for being part of an institution and in a group, but regardless, we're getting far afield here. My only point is, is that, that too many leaders of institutions or members of institutions are just simply parasitic about those institutions and use them as platforms to right. perform upon for their own needs. And it, my point is, it's just a collective action problem. It is a problem with the civil right. discourse. It is a problem our institutions aren't working properly because of this dynamic. And I don't know necessarily how to fix it, but um, I think that that's a big part that's driving the dysfunction of our parties. 
dysfunction of the media. Um, and I think you know Bob is right that at some point we'll figure out how to adapt to this and we'll create new institutions that actually serve purposes for people in ways that that can reconcile some of these things. But it's, we're going to have to go through to get there. Yeah, and at the largest level, I mean, we are not reconciling individual incentives with the welfare of society as a whole. I mean, that you know, in a healthy society, you're doing all of that. I mean, there, uh, you know, people's interests are 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 converge with the interests of the institutions they're part of, and which in turn converge with the interests of the society at large. And right now, this does not seem to be happening. Yep. You know, I mean, I, I wouldn't, you know, I, uh, you can use the word con if you want, Mickey, I, I, but what, what certainly has to happen is institutions have to provide incentives uh, that, that, that succeed in making people behave in the interest of the institution. It's just that in the current environment, they, they can't figure out how to do that. I, mean, I think there's a huge payoff in terms of politicians that help make, make people's lives better. Uh, the the bizarre example is Trump. I mean, Trump is a madman who nobody in their right mind would want in office, except that the Trump years were pretty good for a large swath of Americans, so they cut him a whole lot of slack uh, until COVID hit. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I think you know the the however he did it, he, the, the fact that he produced good results for a, quite a while uh, shows that, th that there is a payoff, even if he's frittering it away. Well, we have been doing this for close to 90 minutes, so um, should probably either uh, reach some green conclusion or give up. I, th I thought that home economicus crap was below the belt. <laughs> it's I've, funny, Mickey. I've, I've never known you to be I've, one to nurse a grudge I've, before. I, no, I just, <laughs> I just remember. I just remember. I wrote this book, and and uh, this this guy I respect came up to me. Oh, I see. You're against Homo economicus, and I don't know. So I've always so, so make up your mind myself and resisting that charge. Right, That's all. <laughs> can't be both. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, um, but uh, anything either of you want to say to the other aside from petty recriminations? But, although those are welcome. No, I mean, like, I, it's great to see you guys. Um, uh, congratulations on. I mean, I don't want to say congratulations on the end of blogging TV, but congratulations on all non-zero stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I, well, it's, it's kind of like you and, and Fox and CNN. When I, when I left Blogging Heads, I had no idea I'd wind up at non-zero. No, actually, that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. But, but uh, anyway, uh, yeah, proceed. And, your... and, you know, Mickey, I, I think you made some terrible choices with, with <laughs> Donald Trump, but I, I don't know that that's a shock to anybody that I, I think that, and I, I think that, yeah, there are some trade-offs with, with electing Donald Trump that benefited some people, but the the sort of radioactive half-life uh, of Trumpism is well, it's, it's hard a to real problem for the society. It's it's hard to defend Trump after COVID hit. He started to fuck up big time after COVID, in a way that outweighed his, the good. So I, I I wouldn't even try to do it. And that was what you predicted. So mm -hmm. uh, you know I it, I'm humbled. In, in, in terms of <laughs> humbled and honored, uh, honored in, in to be in your presence. How and far I'm willing to press my argument. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, you guys. We Thank should do the skins up now. And also, Jonah, uh, I'm not, you know, when, when blogging had started, I at one point, uh, these were before the days of the webcam. I, I think I delivered you like a big camcorder. I'm not sure a you couple. ever gave, I'm not sure you ever gave that back, but whatever. As long um, as you, you know, got a few bucks for it on eBay. <laughs> that, that would be funny if you had it right. Oh, my God, Jonah, that's it. Is that it? Is that it? It's, I think it's one of them, yeah. Like, you guys sent up because one didn't work. You sent me another one. Isaac Chotner, now of The New Yorker. Yeah, yeah. It's it's in my living room. Job. As, you know, Isaac's yeah. first job was with Blogging Heads. And yeah. that's my fucking camcorder, too. This is the other thing I want to say, Jonah. All right, well. And you, ain't, you ain't getting away with try that. Try and get it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you soon, buddy. Uh, okay. Well, thanks, you guys. And uh, and uh, everybody should check out the dispatch and Cal's files and non-zero.